Thank you, and to those of you just joining us today, welcome. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, we had a great set of speakers yesterday who talked about all sorts of these different challenges uh, that we're facing with this problem of plastic pollution in our waters. And I think that today we'll have a great um, insight into some of the various takes we can have on solution methods, basically. So um, at this time, I'd like to present today's first speaker, uh, Rachel Z. Miller. Rachel Z. Miller is the founder of the Rosalia Project for the Clean Ocean the co-inventor and CEO of Coraball, and a National Geographic Explorer. I'll let her tell you about some of those organizations uh, during her presentation. Uh, the Coraball is the world's first microfiber catching laundry ball and a tool to make an impact, raise awareness, and inspire innovation around the problem of microplastic and microfiber pollution worldwide. Rachel has been the principal investigator on several expeditions focused on microplastic pollution, the latest of which is to sample the air, water, and soil along the entire Hudson River. She holds a USCG 50-ton master's license and captains a 60-foot sailing research vessel, American Promise. Her academic background is in marine studies and underwater archaeology. It is with great pleasure that I now invite Rachel Miller to give her keynote presentation. Yes. Thank you. Yesterday was about the problem of marine debris, and we went a little bit into solutions. And today is about solutions, and I'm sure we'll go a little bit back into the problem. You heard both of us say solutions with an S. And I'm going to start with some of our guiding principles as far as it applies to working on the problem of marine debris and solutions. There are five that we use, and the first is that this problem requires a suite, a web, a matrix, whatever you'd like to call a group of solutions. There's not just one that's going to magically fix the problem. Our second is that if I had $100 or $100 million or whatever the question was yesterday to put towards one thing in this problem, it would be to figuring out how to make a cultural shift in recognizing that everything has value. So ideally, we don't even use the word waste. It's just things in another form that can do a different thing. Beautiful things. Yeah. Our third guiding principle is that this requires radical interdisciplinarity. And I have to give credit to uh, the Environmental Solutions Initiative for using that phrase. I love that phrase and believe that we need people from all professional backgrounds and industries to address this. This is something that I like to say, this is, a, this is about grassroots. This is about your vote counts. Lots of littles make a big. A lot of little tiny problems can make a really big problem and a lot of little efforts can add up to big positive impact. And finally, large corporations cut a wide path. This I realized at a Global Action Summit last year when the CEO of Unilever was being in interviewed by Jane Goodall, and he said that he was going to start sourcing sustainable palm oil, and he was taking Walmart with him. And if Walmart and Unilever are sourcing sustainable palm oil, they are really cutting a wide path for other people to access that as well. So the we that I'm talking about is Rosalia Project for a Clean Ocean. We're a nonprofit. We live in Vermont and do our winter work there, and we're based here in New England the rest of the year. What sets us apart from other marine debris organizations is that we address the problem through multiple angles. We do clean up. Then we do prevention through education, we embrace innovation and technology, and do solutions-based research. We work on the whole water column from the surface to the sea floor. So that means obviously the shoreline is very accessible. We are on the surface using some fairly low-tech equipment. That's a pool skimmer and a boat hook. And I'd like to introduce you to Hector the Collector, our inspection class ROV. 
We have had a deliberate focus from the very start on our urban and coastal waters. So much, likely the majority, of marine debris comes from the land-sea interface. We believe that's where the most efficient and cost-effective solutions will be. We thrive on great partnerships, including MIT's Environmental Solutions Ini Initiative and others that help us amplify our impact, spread curricula, there's obviously funding, partnerships, and academic partnerships. We are optimistic. In the face of an overwhelming problem, we are still optimistic because we recognize that the problem of marine debris is one that the collective we made and we believe the collective we can get ahead of it. And finally, we operate from this 60-foot sailing research vessel. Any sailors in the room? Hopefully you're kind of salivating right now. This was a really stunner, stunning day off the coast. We're sort of off Beverly, sort of just northern Massachusetts. Uh, this is a special boat. I could talk about it for a long time, but I'll give you the basics. It held the nonstop solo circumnavigation record by Dodge Morgan in 1986, donated to Naval Academy. We're the third owners, and we've made her the greenest sailing research vessel in the world. We do have uh, diesel for propulsion, but solar, wind, and hydro for our house bank, and we haven't turned the generator on or plugged into shore power for our house bank needs in five years. In terms of the problems of marine debris, the ones we work on are derelict fishing gear, consumer debris, and microplastic. And we really think about where our role is in the continuum of starting with knowledge and working towards solutions. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, is that balance, and our expertise is really in two parts of this, but I wanted you to be able to read our solution. So zooming in, we see, and we're, we're moving this around, this is sort of a working, a working document, is five categories of seven solutions, and we're gonna talk about these at the end, uh, this last part of my presentation. So my experience and expertise and our group is largely in expedition science at the very front end, and in solution development, especially education awareness and innovation and redesign. It's, this all started for us, so I'm gonna get into some of the solutions that we developed. And a lot of that has been focused on the problem of microplastic, and it all comes from our expeditions, what we learn, recognizing problems, and then seeing if we can solve some of them. Or, taking apart. So one was looking at microplastic in our urban and coastal waters, especially cities. So we didn't sail American Promise to all these places. We had partners and looked at floating trash in 10 of our cities. This is not the case all the time, but shows what's possible, so a snapshot. And we learned that there is quite a bit of trash floating in our urban harbors. This isn't just about the center of our ocean gyres. This isn't just about garbage patches that are really still made up of microplastic. And so we also realized that we could predict where these mats of a mixture of organic and inorganic matter were floating. And then once we found them, figured out that while there are large pieces of trash that you can see, much of what is in here is microplastic, just kind of woven in with all the organic matter. And so we set about making a low bycatch marine debris net. We took our inspiration from nature. It's called the baleen basker. So it's a little bit of whale baleen and a little bit of basking shark. And we test it by hanging interns off the end of the spinnaker pole to, uh, in, in three knots of current where we moor and kittery. So uh, what's happening here is we're testing the uh, rate at which the baleen basker is excluding organic matter and collecting known microplastic, except there's there was some in the river. We ended up with more microplastic than we had in our test. Our early results were, our sort of mid results, we were getting a 92% recovery on the microplastic and a 94% exclusion of the organic matter. And this, pro this project right now is on hold because while we were doing that, we learned about another problem. I know that everyone in the room is familiar with microfiber pollution, but who's seen it? who has seen what microfiber pollution looks like. This is our clothes breaking up and coming out the washing machine. Well, here it is. 
This is microfiber that came out of our washing machine, dried and magnified. Now, I wanted to put a little bit in, this is added from yesterday, just to give you a little bit more information about the problem. This is to set it up. These are magnified images of eight different textiles. So hopefully you're starting to guess right now. That's acrylic, polyester woven, polyester non-woven, so that's a fleece. We have here a cotton poly blend. No one's ever guessed, although I feel like if it's ever gonna happen, maybe it's this morning, so you guys can ponder if anyone knows what that is. This is uh, nylon spandex, linen, and rayon, and this is what 100% cotton can look like, magnified. The, the point here is our clothes are vulnerable to breaking. They're pretty technical and spectacular, and they do incredible things to keep us warm or cool, uh, but they're vulnerable. Anyone know what that one is? A guess? Cortex? It's neoprene, so it's a wetsuit, a black wetsuit. I think it's kind of beautiful. In terms of the magnitude of our clothes breaking in the washing machine, there's been some peer-reviewed research that one said that a fleece, fleece jacket could shed an average of over 81,000 fibers per garment per wash. Another looked at an acrylic long sleeve polo shirt up to, this is a top end, 700,000 fibers per garment per wash. And honestly, there's really nothing to stop something that small. The filters that are in washing machines now will only keep my business card that you leave in your pocket from washing out your pipes. And we know the pipes are vulnerable from everything that we learned yesterday. And so this is what's going out to septic tanks or wastewater treatment as far as we know. So oh, I'm back up run here and I wanted to add a couple things. There were some questions yesterday so microfiber has been found in honey, salt. It's been found in chicken in Mexico. That's all um, peer reviewed. There's a report by Orb Media, not, it was self-published by them, that documented microfiber being found in both tap water and bottled water. It's been found in 220 species. That was from a literature review. And this, what I normally talk about this, would say this is as bad as this talk gets. It's been found in beer. But from now on, this talk gets more hopeful and it's all about solutions from now. So we have a solution and the one that Adrian uh, talked about is the Cora Ball. This is the Cora Ball, here's a, here's a real one. The Cora Ball's made in Vermont. You can read all about it online. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it is made of recycled and recyclable material. We have some cool co-shipping partnerships that allow us to be zero manufacturing or zero packaging waste between manufacturing and assembly. It's meant to last five years. It can be used in any washing machine, so you just toss it in. It too was, to, was inspired by coral, so the coral stalks inside the coral ball essentially help, it's a mechanical catch. So the little fibers and hair, big people hair like mine or dog hair, we used to have two Newfoundlands, uh, get stuck in there. Not all pet hair gets stuck in there before you get too excited. And uh, in its, oops. We brought it out of our nonprofit and spun it into its own corporation. I can talk more about that offline. We kick-started it to start and we've been bootstrapping ever since. We've had some attention on it because it's a way to have impact right away. And like Adrian said, our goal is also to inspire innovation upstream and downstream. This is not the solution to microfiber, but certainly a solution. And thinking about lots of littles making a big, a published paper that looked at its efficiency, figured out that if all of Toronto used the Cora Ball, so the whole community used the Cora Ball, together they could keep six to nine trillion fibers out of their wastewater treatment plant every year. So the Cora Ball's up and running, it's at the New England Aquarium, and I think we're at 20 aquaria throughout the country and online. But while we're developing solutions, we're also trying to understand the problem better. And there hasn't been, especially when we started working on this in 2014, very much published. And so the way we do that generally is going on these expeditions. In this case, we wanted to see microfiber in the wild. So we went to the Hudson River. We sampled the surface every three miles from Lake Tier of the Clouds to Ambrose Light, where the Hudson meets the Atlantic. And we did not find what we expected. 
And we don't really have enough other research to know how to place the number. So what we found that was really significant for us was that despite the fact that 20% of the Hudson River does not have municipal wastewater, it's like where I live in Vermont, everyone has septic system leach fields, there was no statistically significant difference in concentration of microplastic across the whole Hudson River. So that effectively means that there is as much, oops, that there is as much fiber and microplastic where there are virtually no people and no wastewater treatment as there is adjacent to Manhattan. And so the first thing I did after hearing that was to go outside and look outside our dryer exhaust because that has to mean that there's another source. And this is what the foliage looked like outside my dryer. There's fuzz all over it. Magnified, that's what that looks like. And if you remember, this is what the fiber coming out of our washing machine looks like. So it's really the same stuff. And so for me, when our science says that what we thought was happening wasn't happening, that means we get to go on another expedition. So <laughs> two years later, we this, this year, we went back to the Hudson, this time funded by National Geographic and Kilroy Realty and Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, and we went and sampled at the same sites, but this time, we collected samples from the air, my inhalation height, as well as at nine meters when we were on the boat, which was Ambrose to Albany, we sampled uh, the soil, so three soil, uh, soil sample, whoops, three soil samples. We sampled the surface of the water, the midwater column, and a meter above the bottom. And we also teamed up with a company who's doing work with flow cytometry to investigate whether there are nanoplastics and if that equipment can detect nanoplastics uh, at each of the same locations. On the way back, we also had a look at vertical distribution of microplastic as it relates to wastewater treat marked wastewater treatment plant outflows at a, suburban, a rural, suburban, and urban wastewater treatment plants along the Hudson and East Rivers. And that was all a tease because I can't share any results with you yet. So stay in touch. We're excited to see what all of that reveals. While we were on the Hudson River, we were also supporting other innovations, specifically some science-enabling innovations. This is a tape that fixes vacuum filter filters so that when you sneeze, you don't ruin them. Anyone who's done vacuum filtration, you would be jumping up and down right now. Uh, we also have uh, a partnership with Ocean Diagnostics. This is Ethan Edson out of Northeastern University who is also working uh, like Draper on a, but a different system, um, in situ microplastic sampler, which would be pretty amazing. And also taking samples in ways that will support training data sets for machine learning and the ability to be able to do more prediction of what is in rivers as far as microplastics, where they can be found and then working on providing data for machine learning as it applies to cameras being able to detect, this would be macroplastic, uh, which would be really great to be able to put cameras on boats that are already going normal routes that would help us understand what's happening and then what the result of actions are. We, we, we are weaving our science into education as well by working on, for the last four years, microplastics education. And that is everything from including young people in understanding what it takes to take the samples. I'm working with these kids. These kids would be hopefully future MIT Water Prize participants. They won the Nat Geo, the Nat Geo Geo Challenge. They've invented a little device that helps collect microplastic from rivers, and, uh, and I'm working with them. We work with kids to say, well, if you were a sea creature and you didn't have opposable thumbs, but you ate with things that resembled combs and other tools, and you ate plankton that sort of looked like rice, and there's plastic in that, could you pick it out? We also are doing letting the kids do experiments as they relate to shedding rate. And this is summer bathing suit science. <laughs> We're delivering our programs to, in this case, yacht clubs on the way along Long Island Sound on the way back from our Hudson River trip. All of our work is not about microplastic, though. 
There are other problems in this area that need innovation and need solutions. One of them, this is the anecdotal evidence of trap buoys. These are lobster buoys. It's kind of like a weird, I realize this is like a weird ball pit for adults. <laughs> Not very safe. Uh, and here's the evidence that says that trap buoys are a big problem. In fact, an incredible percentage of all of the marine debris in floating in our oceans. And so one of the projects that we've been working on is a sustainable fishing float that works to replace the current virgin to landfill material and make, take back a more inspiring thing. In the big picture, thinking about education and not just microplastic education, what we're working hard on is going beyond cleanups, using them as a tool for education and working towards solutions, but not just stopping there. So that means collecting data. We're doing behavior change games to spark conversations about what's the last thing that made you change your behavior that inspired you to change your behavior and why. Brainstorm solutions with on topics that scream at people. Microfiber screamed at us, and we're using our experience as a sort of guide to walk people through the opportunity to come up with their own solutions. We talk about what it takes to bring an idea to reality. This is Manu, he actually graduated from MIT in ocean engineering a couple years ago. He was on board as our startup guy. Not everyone has to be technical. We encourage the artists and the wordsmiths to use their skills. So sometimes the solutions that the kids come up with are more messaging related. This is Dwayne the Sustainable Turtle that uh, <laughs> he designed. And we gave him a little 3D printed version. And this is one of my favorites that came out of a workshop. This is effectively a storm drain cover for scuppers on fishing boats. So what this, uh, his name is Tiger, what he didn't like was the five hour energy bottles that we're pretty sure are washing off of lobster boats and lobster claw bands that we think are washing, they're either going overboard or they're washing out in the cockpit water. So that's what screamed at him. This isn't just about kids going beyond cleanups and doing these workshops. We worked with Mars, uh, Mars this summer, so the Candy and More company, and that was great to bring people who have a lot of potential market power to the problem to see what it looks like and talk about solutions. And then finally, we are working very hard on including what National Geographic calls science telling into our programs. So what we're trying to do is inspire people of all ages to get excited about STEM for the ocean but then we also want them to be able to communicate about it, to think about how, what their medium is and how they can do it. So here are some kids doing a little PSA. Uh, I think they were doing one on microplastic. So what I wanna spend just my last uh, bunch of minutes on here is a sort of scene setting of solutions. What you're about to hear is by no means exhaustive. We'd be here for days. Uh, and, but I, and I'm gonna go pretty fast. So it's meant to give you something to think about and hopefully make all of you realize that there is a place for everyone in the suite or web of solutions to the problem of marine debris and plastics in our oceans. So we'll start with education. There's a lot out there. I would argue this is the most crowded of the solutions field. You don't necessarily have to make up your own curriculum if you'd like to do some education. There's heaps and heaps. I wanted to bring your attention to, uh, you've, you heard about Trash and Splash yesterday from Demi, so that's local. Cafeteria culture is interesting. It's based in New York City, and it's a group of educators who are doing a whole array of work. They have a toolkit. They just came out with a video where the kids are working on microplastic, and they have tools to make cafeterias plastic-free at least once, one day a week. Of course, this isn't just about the young kids. So while you know about this, I did want to make sure that we acknowledged the work that's going on at the graduate, well, from undergraduate and beyond level, but in academia, that isn't just vaguely looking at plastic and marine debris, but is doing it in a very specific way. I know you'll hear more about ESI today. Of course, you know about the joint program with MIT and HUI, but HUI is now 
put together a very specific group to focus on microplastics. And one of our partners, our, our scientific partner for the Hudson River trip, has come out of universe, or Staffordshire University in the UK, and interesting, their forensic fiber scientist group. So they started working on microplastics. In terms of messaging, there's a fair amount out there. One of my favorite that you probably have seen, and I like this because it was very effective and it was science-based, is the Beat the Microbead campaign. Here's some of the ultimate results of that, which are microbead bans. Microbeads were an easier problem to work on, certainly, than some other parts of the marine debris problem, though that I don't want to diminish the incredible hard work that uh, everybody did to make this happen. Then there's stuff like balloons blow. I don't know that alliteration is required, but clearly it's helpful. Messaging can happen in different forms. It doesn't have to be words. It can also be pictures. Here's a storm drain painting project to remind people that what gets thrown on the street eventually ends up in the mouths of octopus pie. So that is in, uh, they had all different creatures. And uh, I love this. I'm sure you've seen that in other places. I was just at a World Ocean Forum in Korea. And this guy was on the beach, all made out of marine debris. And I'm happy to share uh, this exquisite piece of marine debris art. Cindy Pizzer, the artist, is here with us. She was one of our guest artists on American Promise a bunch of years ago and does extremely um, what looks like refined and spectacular artwork that is also fun, and she acknowledges where it came from. It is all marine debris that she's found or some of it we provided. Uh, and then she helps people make really not very exquisite versions of <laughs> the marine debris art. So the good one is Cindy's, and the rest was ours, but we had a really good time. So she leads workshops. Uh, so you do a cleanup and then build stuff out of, uh, of the parts that can't be recycled. Another category of solutions is regulation and policy. So there's, that's happening at the federal government level in the Save Our Seas Act. The second Save Our, or Save Our Seas 2.0 is uh, being negotiated now. There is a panel about policy that will happen today, so I'm sure you'll hear more about that. Of course, there are bans as a regulation or a, a policy strategy to handle this, and then there's something I personally find fairly terrible, which is a ban on bans. But then there's people working on banning the ban on bans. So hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that in the policy section. This is hot off the presses. I came here from the Trash Free Seas Alliance meeting in San Diego, so I flew from there to here. And with one of these in my bag, this is available online. For those of you that are interested in international, especially, but this will be applicable in the US, but international policy, especially as it relates to the economics of waste collection and dealing with a lot of the stuff that's out there and creating systems to prevent incredible amounts of trash from escaping the shores, this right here is, uh, will be interesting for you. This is also a great example of science leading to solutions. In 2015, Jenna Jambeck and her team published the paper that said 8 million metric tons are going into our oceans every year. They identified a ranking. We saw that slide yesterday. And there's been an incredible amount of motion that has happened because of that paper. And one of the things that's happened is that a bunch of very large companies got together and they have pledged $1.5 billion to invest in infrastructure in the top five polluter com uh, polluting countries as identified by the paper. And that's a lot of money. There needs to be a lot of strategy that has to, that goes with that. They want to do it the right way, which doesn't mean just jamming Western methods into developing country systems. And this playbook is, will be a way to help that. There was a question yesterday that specifically also asked about items related to EPR, which stands for Extended Producer Responsibility. That's when you shift some of the responsibility off consumers and put it on the people that are producing the items that are ending up in our, in this case, public waterways. And so part of EPR, <laughs> uh, the question was, are there any taxes on some of this stuff? 
And in this playbook that was just published, I don't know if you can read it, but under, they've got four themes, I'm not gonna read you everything, but part of this does include suggesting taxes and levies on single-use plastics, so that's SUPs, and virgin material tax. So that if you wanna use virgin material, it's gonna cost you the way it costs the earth. So um, I've got one of those with me and you can find that online on Ocean Conservancy. The next category is innovation and redesign. This is big, we could do this all day. So I'm just gonna give you a few of them. Uh, here is a seaweed-based straw, so that's interesting. That one and this one would fall technically under bioplastics. Uh, this is a company that was in an accelerator program with us. They're taking essentially waste tree lignin, they're turning it into the product that um, I'm not very good at farm things. It reduces weeds and things like in the strawberry fields, for example. So you know the plastic that gets put on fields. There's a lot of it. I think a lot of what we find in Lake Champlain in Vermont are little tiny fragments from that plastic. I need to figure out how to know that for sure. Uh, so getting rid of that as a petro-based or virgin to landfill style plastic would be pretty awesome. So this company is taking the tree lignin and what happens at the end of a season is you plow that bioplastic into the field. The end is just water, compost, and CO2. So there's some opportunities for bioplastics that are both bio-derived and bio-benign, and that's really interesting. We have some innovation opportunities. I'm putting this in innovation for big data citizen science. There are lots of ways to keep track of what you're picking up. I am biased because we have a Rosalia Project data card on the marine debris tracker, uh, and I've worked with Jenna Jambeck, so this is the one I'm sharing, but there are lots of them. I also like that one because it's open. People can get their data back and do whatever you want with it. There is also efforts to use current low value plastic. Remember, my, my dream here is to make everything of value so that nothing is waste and everything that we use is just seeing different forms. But that's not the case yet, so we have a lot of stuff that just, it's low value, can't be used for very much except going to landfill, that's not cool. So these eco bricks are taking uh, two liter bottles, stuffing them with things like food wrappers that are cleaned into something that's actually quite hard, and then they're reducing the need for more expensive building materials. Okay, you know when you go to the grocery store and you buy meat, and in the meat tray, it's a styrofoam tray, and there's the plastic thing on top, and then there's the meat diaper. Yeah. You guys, you wanna talk about meat diapers at like nine in the morning. So this is, uh, uh, this is a partner of ours, Packaging 2.0. And what he's done is he's done some biomimicry, it's honeycomb. He is going to demonstrate how his recycled PET and recyclable tray can hold moisture just in its shape. And so it can do the job of the meat diaper and no more meat diapers. Some other innovation, I was really just looking at supply chain. I wasn't sure to put this in finance or innovation. There's a company that's buying the nets from Chilean fishermen and turning them into sunglasses and skateboards. So otherwise the Chilean fishermen didn't have a very easy way to go about getting rid of their nets. They'd landfill, they'd put them in the water and they'd just kill indiscriminately. Innovation doesn't have to be this kind of monumental thing. It can be using spaghetti instead of plastic for stirrers. And now infrastructure. So I have a couple examples of infrastructure that are a little back end. So I don't want these to be seen as primary, but there's a lot of stuff out there and collecting it in efficient ways would be awesome, especially in ways where you're not effectively throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So the Great Bubble Barrier does that. Fish can sort of still float around. I'd look it up. They're using bubbles to divert plastics. There's a test one in the Netherlands right now. And then we've got other collection strategies like Mr. and Professor Trash Wheel, and uh, those are right now in Baltimore, but other cities as well, and the sea bins. Chemical recycling is emerging, and I think people should be paying attention to this. It's a broad field. It is not, so incineration is not part of what I'm talking about here. That is, that's a one-way thing. That's arguably maybe better than a landfill, but that's not what I'm talking about. Pyrolysis is a part of this. 
Making something that you could put into a fuel tank is part of this, but that's not everything. Another um, effort that's happening in chemical recycling, and I, I recommend looking up this company, is making virgin grade feedstock out of completely dirty plastic. Mixed dirty plastic that has no value right now and nowhere else to go can be turned into virgin grade feedstock, which means it could be used in better products, like more not single-use plastics, but durable products that could be uh, rated for food grade. Right now, there's countries that ban mechanical recycling as a, as a method for food grade storage. My last category of solutions is finance and using economics to drive as the solution. So here's something interesting is in June, USAID announced that they were de-risking investments in waste infrastructure in the top five polluting countries from Jenna Jambeck's paper. So this is what's called blended finance, private-public partnership. I find this fascinating. People are commoditizing ocean-bound plastic, so you can just buy it on the open market. And then there are people, this is the plastic bank, who are essentially turning plastic into currency, especially in developing nations, and saying, pick it up and then use it to trade just like you would with currency for goods. There are also companies who are making the economic improvement of people's lives in developing countries part of their supply chain. This company is called Reflow, and they're based out of the Netherlands. They are taking the plastic and turning it into uh, 3D print filament but their supply chains are unusual. They are buying from waste collectors in India and working to support the children of waste collectors, and also they're taking KLM's recyclable plastic from uh, flights. I'm gonna leave you with just a little philosophy when you're thinking about it. I think that everyone in this room has an opportunity to be part of one of or multiple solutions to the problem of marine debris and plastic in our ocean. And just a little bit of ways to think about it. So one is, let's stop anything from getting out of the system of use it and reuse it. That sometimes happens. I thought about this a lot with microfiber, so that would be making our clothes more resilient. That would be the example of stop the leakage. The next, or preventing leakage. The next would be, okay, well, we're not 100% there in some categories on that. We could do better with our clothes being more resilient, but ooh, we're still losing some of those fibers. So the next would say, okay, well, don't let them into the ocean. Don't let them into our rivers or lakes or bays. And so what are some ideas to stop that leakage that we miss? The coral clearly is there. That's where we put that. Not meant to be the only one, but it'll help. And then finally to say, okay, well, we're still missing a little bit. There's still some getting through. There's not 100% stoppage on this stuff. So let's capture it and put it back in the system and say there is no such thing as waste. It's just stuff that is in a different form to be used a different way. If this is exciting to you, or you feel like you need some forced fresh air and to get your hands dirty, sandy, salty, and muddy, here's our schedule for next summer. We'll be here in the Boston area in June and in Midcoast, Maine this year in July and August. We like people from a variety of different academic, professional, geographic, and age backgrounds. Minimum age is 18. Our maximum so far is 71. Uh, we had an onboard reporter who was 71. Uh, just keep an eye on rosaliaproject.org. Sign up for our newsletter. Come see me. We are also a potential ship of opportunity. If you need to take samples, we can either take them for you or you could come on board American Promise as part of the crew to conduct your own science alongside our cleanup science and education. I am really grateful for this opportunity to be here, to be part of this. I learned so much yesterday and look forward to speaking with more of you today. Thank you.